boarding passes. I've got boarding passes. And you know you're in trouble when you get one of these. Yep, the essentials kit. Hello tarantula lovers, I'm Alex and you're watching Tarantula Haven. So yes, my trip to California started out as a complete nightmare. Um, the day that I was supposed to fly out, I found out my flight got canceled and um, I, I didn't get booked until the, ne the next day. So I lost a day of vacation and uh, the following day, before I even got to the airport, I found out that my connecting flight had been delayed and it was going to miss my connecting flight at another airport. So that started a chain of events that ended up with me and my wife booking flights and rebooking flights and so on to try to get us to California on the same day because there was one delay and cancellation after the other and it was just a complete nightmare. Um, finally, after traveling all day, um, and thanks to my wife, she booked us on a flight that they told us was going to be a chance, taking a chance because there wasn't enough time between connecting flights. But fortunately, because of their delays, there was enough time and I got there on time and got to California within the same day. Unfortunately, my luggage did not, hence the essentials kit. So um, yeah, and, and my luggage wasn't there. It's supposed to arrive the next day at 1030. Um, I filed a claim and uh, the woman wrote down the wrong baggage number. So there was another delay because they couldn't find my luggage because they were looking for the wrong baggage number. I didn't get my luggage until the following day. So yeah, it was just completely uh, disastrous and my I couldn't do anything until I got clothes because I was wearing the same clothes for a couple of days so it was just a, a just a mess um, but once I was there the vacation started and everything I will not be flying American Airlines again this was the first time I've ever flown American Airlines and and it was just a disaster normally I usually take Delta but it was a bit pricier now I know why um, anyway so once I got to California my trip was more or less pretty much to see my parents. They're up in age. My dad's getting ready to turn 90, I believe, and uh, they're not in the best of health. So yeah, that was definitely the purpose for my trip. See my family, everybody that lives in California, which is the majority of my side of the family. So yeah, it was more of a personal thing. So I didn't do as much adventuring as I wish I could have. But that's not to say that adventure doesn't find me. Usually wherever I go, somehow I find some kind of adventure. So here's a little video of some of the stuff that I did while I was in California and that little bit of adventure with wildlife that I had while I was there. When I come back, I've got some bad news to share. I have fond memories of Olvera Street. I remember coming here as a young child because the Mexican consulate is located nearby. Um, before my parents became U.S. citizens, oh, there's my dad, he's picking out a hat, he was on a mission, and uh, yeah, he'll be 90 this year. But anyway, um, after my parents got done with their affairs and uh, they would let us go and browse the trinkets and treasures that there were there. And uh, you know, they would always let us pick something out and we would always get something to take home from our trip to Olvera Street. Somehow, Dia de los Muertos is probably one of the most Mexican things you can find here. And let us not forget the Coco guitar. And is that Petco I see there? <laughs> We also went to the Broad. Um, the Broad's an art gallery slash museum that was founded by philanthropists Eli and Edith Broad. Uh, they had a, an amazing collection of works from various artists such as Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, Roy Coons, and many, many more. Um, one of the best things about the Broad is that it's absolutely free. Unfortunately, we didn't get to go into the infinity room because it was completely booked for the day and that's one of the drawbacks about it because it's free you kind of have to reserve your spot um, but you know that just gives us an excuse to come back and see it another day
And there's my brother acting the fool, pretty much like I do whenever I go anywhere. And the last bookstore is probably the largest bookstore I've ever been to. People can buy and sell books here, even just sit around and read. Uh, it amazed me that there was so much interest in actual books in the age of ebooks. I guess people still like the feel of turning the page instead of swiping a screen, huh? And there's my favorite section. And that is my niece, Emma. She's the one that guided us on this little tour. Hi, Marla. That's my uh, sister-in-law. And there is my shy daughter, Elise, and my two lovely nieces, Sammy and Alexis. Los Angeles has so many interesting buildings and things to see. Even the grit and the grime of the city was interesting to me. There's the famous but now closed million dollar theater. And uh, we checked out the Bradbury building and uh, the architecture here was just incredible. Um, it was actually used in the original movie Blade Runner, which was pretty cool. Speaking of Blade Runner, uh, we went to the Central Market. I thought it was really cool because it reminded me of one of those futuristic markets that you see in movies like Blade Runner or uh, Total Recall or something like that, where you have all these people bustling around from all the, these different nationalities and all the neon lights and just so much stuff to look at. And the food, the food was just amazing. There was all kinds of food from different countries. You had Mexican, you had Thai, you had Filipino, Japanese, you name it, whatever you were looking for, you could probably find it here at the Central Market. Just an amazing place. And I promised you a little adventure. Um, yes, adventure sometimes finds me. Uh, we went to um, my brother's sister-in-law's house to pick up some tables and chairs for a party we were having. And in their driveway, there happened to be this beautiful um, gopher snake. And at first I thought it was a bull snake, but then I realized the coloring was too light. So I looked it up and it turned out to be a gopher snake. And uh, it was just huge. Um, 
And that's me, I'm not taunting the snake, I'm holding the phone with one hand, but I'm kind of gauging its temperament just to see if I can pick it up and how difficult it was going to be, whether it was going to be docile or whether it was going to be, you know, wanting to bite me. But it seemed more interested in getting away, so I thought it was pretty cool to go ahead and try. Uh, I'm sorry about the uh, footage there with me not having the snake centered on the screen, but it was a little bit difficult to try to catch it with one hand and hold the phone with the other. I asked if they had a golf club so I could possibly pin the head down, but I think they thought I was trying to kill it. <laughs> so I finally grabbed it by the tail, and yeah, it was pretty docile. It actually was so docile, it, it seemed like it might have been somebody's pet, but I'm sure it came from, you know, from the wild. And there it is. And I, I would say probably for me holding it there, it was probably five or six feet long. So the reason I captured it is so we could put it in a container because they do have a local snake wrangler that collects snakes and takes them out and re-releases them back into the wild. So this one's going back to the wild. So my trip to California was pretty fun. Uh, it was really fun getting to see family and friends and all that and uh, of course playing tourist and going to visit downtown Los Angeles and seeing the sights there. I left when I was 18 years old and it was much different back then so Los Angeles has really changed for me and it was really neat to have that experience. Um, now the bad news, when I got back from California um, one of the things that I noticed was that my P. regalis who had an egg sac was sitting out here on the side of the enclosure and I realized that she no longer had an egg sac. Um, she had eaten the egg sac so I was pretty sad and disappointed about that. And if I look here right here on the leaves here this little piece of bolus right here that is what is left of the egg sac that's what I found sitting inside of the water dish and uh, yeah she had thoroughly just chewed it all up and uh, was looking nice and plump so that was definitely not a good thing I had envisioned having a communal of P. regalis and all these different things, but you know, that's just how it goes. Obviously she wasn't comfortable with, with where she originally made her egg sac because she did move out of there and move to the back over here. I had to pull the egg sac out and hand it to her and she took it again. Uh, the sad part is while I was on vacation, that would have been the 30 days that she would have had the egg sac and I would have probably pulled that egg sac out and uh, incubated it myself once they turned into eggs with legs and uh, hopefully it had uh, the, the spiderlings to take care of. But because I was on vacation, it just fell to bad timing and uh, you know, who knows? She may have eaten, would have eaten it while I was here anyway. It was just bad timing altogether. So next time, there will be a next time I'll be prepared and hopefully things will go much better. Um, I found out a few more things that I didn't know before as to what I need to do to be a little bit more successful. So I'll try those things and hopefully I will be able to produce an egg sac with her um, soon. So now that she no longer has an egg sac, I got to feed her and fatten her back up so that I can try to breed her again. I still have my males and uh, one of them I don't think is any good anymore, but the other one I think is still viable. So I'll try to breed them again and maybe this time I'll be able to record some of the footage. So let's see if I can get her to eat. And she's still back here somewhere. See if she's hungry, which she probably is since she ate her egg sac. I'm not happy about that. Oh, there's some movement. I see legs. There she is. You hungry? Hmm? 
Oop, he's just mad. Wow. See your fat abdomen there? So anyway, I don't know. She's pretty fat. Um, I don't know if all that's nutrients from the egg sac that she ate, but um, she just seemed pretty defensive as if she was still taking care of her egg sac. I don't know if they tend to double clutch. I'll have to ask around because sometimes some tarantulas will produce another egg sac immediately after they get done with one. So that's a possibility. I'm not sure. I'll have to investigate on that. But anyway, you got to see her. She's pretty mad and uh, <laughs> she didn't want to eat the roach, but she ate her egg sac. Fortunately, um, I still have the egg sac for my P. cambridgei, so hopefully I'll get some babies out of that, and uh, we'll see that hopefully in the near future. So now on to the main focus of this video, and that is the Brachypelma baby pairing part two. If you remember the last time I tried to pair them, neither one of them wanted anything to do with each other and it was just a big, clumsy, awful affair like my flight. Um, <laughs> and uh, nothing happened, so I was really shocked. Uh, I felt like neither one of them was prepared for pairing, so it was just a complete and total bust. So this time I'm going to try to pair them again. I'm taking a different approach and let's see what happens. So this time, um, by different approach, what I did is I basically just put their enclosures side by side and opened the lids, and I figured I'd just let him take care of it himself. I, I didn't help him out of the enclosure, I just left it alone. And uh, it didn't take very long for him to already start going and, and moving around. He'd already been wandering around quite a bit, so I figured he'd probably continue that, but I didn't know if he would you know, triangulate on her or what and I figured he was just gonna roam around and, and kinda, you know, maybe accidentally find his way toward her. But I was very shocked that it seemed like he just kinda zeroed in on her and went right into her enclosure, which, you know, I was very hopeful about this because that's exactly what I wanted to see. Now, I did have other people online that had recommended that I put the female in the male's enclosure and I've never heard of such a thing. Um, to me, that seems counterproductive because the female usually sits in their burrow and the males are the ones that tend to wander around, which is why people find them all the time. So I really didn't want to do that. Um, so again, you know, I just tried the same thing, but this time without any of my assistance to disturb the male or spook him in any way. And, uh, you know, it seemed to work pretty well. He went straight in there and uh, yeah, there he is. Um, just kind of feeling his way around but you know I wasn't sure what he was gonna do and um, I had freshened up the females water so I guess she was thirsty because she started wandering over in that direction. And sure enough, it didn't take very long and she went ahead and got into the bowl and started drinking. So as she was drinking, he saw it as an opportunity to get in closer. And again, I wasn't really sure if he was all that aware that she was there. And uh, last time he seemed pretty unaware. So yeah, you know, I just kind of watching and waiting and seeing and I was really nervous because I didn't have any tongs in the way or anything like that. So I didn't want her to chomp him. But yeah, right there it was pretty hopeful he starts shaking 
and doing the little vibrating thing. So that let me know that he's very well aware that she's there and she hadn't reacted even though he's touched her foot there. And as he makes an attempt to get closer, I started to get a little bit discouraged because she starts moving away. And this is exactly the same thing that happened last time. So, you know, I figured, oh, the same thing is going to happen. She's not interested. She's probably not ready. And she tries to move away. But then, woo! <laughs> that is what you want to see in a male. He, he just kind of went for it but she turned around real defensively because she doesn't know who's coming to get her. But he tries again, and, and that is what you want to see, that persistence. They want to get, they want to breed pretty bad, and they will try as much as they can if they're really ready. So this is looking really, really good. This is exactly what you want to see. You saw me grab the tongs there for a little bit because I got real nervous because those fangs came out. And like I said before, she was acting a little bit defensive, but this time he seems to know what he's doing and he's going for it, he's pushing her up. And there he goes with those palps, just a drumming on her sternum there, which is a real good thing. Him getting under there and just a beating. There we go. And I think we had a little insertion right there, but he keeps going and he keeps drumming. And now he's like really, really getting underneath her, and I'm getting real nervous because I don't want her to get him. Those fangs are sure scary looking. There he goes again, he's getting under there real, real good. And that's where he probably has his best insertion there. And I believe he probably did get both petty palps inserted because he spent a whole lot of time under there going back and forth and drumming and so on. So I'm pretty positive that we had a good insertion on this one. There we go. He's really bending her back right there. So at this point, I think it looks like he's starting to back out. So that's probably the second most tense moment when you do these pairings. At first with the initial lockup, you never know how the female's gonna react and whether or not she's gonna get the male. And then on the back out, because he's vulnerable here, he's trying to ease his way back. And of course I'm getting nervous, so I get my tongs again 
And uh, yeah, so this is, you know, he's kind of in an odd position there. She's got his legs wrapped up in her legs and he's kind of easing out sideways. But, you know, you gotta be real careful. I'm ready with the tongs just in case I have to get between the two of them so that he can escape. And just like that, he makes a nice clean getaway and she hardly even went after him. She's like, what, what happened? <laughs> so yeah, I'm ecstatic at this point. And now it's just me collecting him and trying to get him back in his enclosure. And he's probably looking for his enclosure because he's in unfamiliar territory. So he's just kind of going toward the table there and then he ends up going around the uh, her enclosure and then back into his. So mission accomplished, Boris, and uh, I get him back in his enclosure, and he's already lined up to pair up with somebody else's um, female. So yeah, lucky him. Yeah, boy, get it? Oh man, I'm so happy, I can't believe that he did a, such a good job. Uh, it was just completely different from last time. I can't believe it. it he just like went for it. And that's what you, you normally see when you pair tarantulas together. When the male is ready, he's just all into it and the female just kind of doesn't know what hits her. And uh, that's exactly what happened. It seemed like she still wasn't interested, but he went in there and got the job done the way he should have. And I am so happy. now. Nothing is set in stone yet. I still have to go through the whole uh, her go being gravid and seeing if she produces an egg sac and then seeing if she maintains that egg sac and doesn't destroy it or eat it like my P. regalis. So anyway, um, yeah, I hope things go well. I'm excited. I would love to be producing Mexican fire legs or Brachypelma baby. Uh, so yeah, this is just an exciting thing for me. So before I leave you today, I'd like to bring your attention to my t-shirt. This was provided to me by Ray of Jeepers Creepers Tarantulas. If you haven't checked out Jeepers Creepers Tarantulas, I highly suggest you go check him out. He's got a lot of breeding projects going on and he's got a huge collection and uh, just a lot of cool stuff to check out over there. So I'll post a link to his channel down below so you can go to check him out, give him a like, maybe subscribe. Um, and, and this shirt is really cool. Um, I know you can't see the back of it, but I'll put a picture right here of the back of this shirt. And uh, yes, if you talk to me about tarantulas, I will talk to you for three hours. I have no self-control either. So yeah, it's a really cool shirt. You should get one. So that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give me a like. If you want to see more, subscribe. If you want to support this channel, I have a Redbubble store. I'll post a link down below so you can check that out where I do sell Tarantula Haven merchandise. All the proceeds from the Tarantula Haven merchandise will go directly to help grow and support this channel. If you want a miserable flying experience, fly American Airlines. Until next time, keep loving them tarantulas.